Okay, you're listening to the Big Breakdown Podcast with Chris Stafford and Harrison Marshall. Take it away, fellas. Hello and welcome along to episode 9 of the Big Breakdown Podcast. Today we are bringing everything together around understanding the who, what and how, which was the theme of, of this season. To, to give a, a working example of what that looked like in reality when myself, Harrison and Steve started coaching the Enzians and how we brought this in kind of like a, a tactical periodization model, which we're hoping that from a, there's a lot of stuff out there in terms of tactical periodization for what you can use from the professional game. There's very little out there that talks about how it's been applied within a community environment and what that looks like. So we're hoping that today we can give lots of, of practical examples, lots of discussion topics that you can go away and as you're starting to plan your new season, you can put some of these into practice ready for the new season starting. At the end of the podcast as well, we're going to announce the winners of our Canterbury Boot giveaway. Mind you, we've got four pairs to give away that we're giving away across Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. And we'll announce the lucky winners at the end. Um, Harrison, how are you? Uh, I'm good, thank you, Chris. I am very good. Very good. I've um, busy week, busy week. We've had two fixtures, two matches, two actual matches to go and watch and coach at. So it's... um. Cloud nine, cloud nine. Yeah, Yourself? Well, I'm in, I'm in the office, but for those on YouTube, where I am in room 101, um, lots of things do go missing in here as well. But uh, I, yeah, I'm at work. I've been teaching today. I'm about to head up to West Park and coach the ladies. I just hope it stops raining. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Yorkshire, so that's probably not going to happen. I'm probably going to go oh, to the mind. We've got bright sunshine down here in Oxford. That's... Closer to the equator, of course, so it's obviously a lot lot warmer, a lot sunnier. Definitely. Uh, interesting episode today, talking about our our experiences at, at NCNs. Um, I think there should be a lot of content that, that coaches can use, though. Oh, oh, definitely. Uh, definitely. And our, you know, as, we're, as we're going on and we're explaining what we've kind of um, implemented at all NCNs during the 2017-18 uh, season, um, I mean, this, this is just an example of, of of what the three of us, the five of us, really um, kind of did over the, over the season. And you, you know, we're just sharing this so coaches listening can can take bits and bobs and and give it a go at their clubs and uh, and see what works for them in, in in their environments, really. Yeah. So for those on on YouTube, it's a bit of a presentation to go with it. If you are listening on on a podcast platform, uh, you can go to YouTube at uh, the Big Breakdown HQ, and you'll be able to access that that way and, and just have some visuals to go with it. Um, should, we, should we load it up? So before we go into anything else, it's, it's just important to outline the context and understand the environment that we were sort of walking into um, because it was our first season at the club. So we need to really get that understanding of what Old Otley Indians is because that's really important in terms of how we structured and how we built the, the targets and the sessions and everything else that went with it. So. It's a level nine Northern Division club, so that's Yorkshire three. Um, it's senior, so the, all the players are aged between 18 and 44. There's no junior section. Um, the club runs two teams. Uh, like I've already alluded to, it was our first season at the club. So we, we wanted to really get in there and, and make an impact. And there was five coaches in the team. So it was myself, Harrison, Steve Quinn, Cal Patterson, Pete Tempest was director of rugby, and we had two medical staff, Jules and, and Derek, who were, you know, probably the, the most valued people within a club think they, they, they kept everyone fresh from, in what was a, a long season with with lots of games and like I said it's important that we understand that context because that shapes the direction that we then needed to, to take the club in yeah oh, no, I think you know what we've alluded to as well are from you know from from episodes one and I think it, it showcased from episodes one to episode eight is is understanding the who is is, is, is massively important before we can start even begin thinking about implementing any sort of rugby structure and you know the, the, for us and uh, understanding and getting these players in and, and actually understanding our context was vital with that um you know and, and a big part of that i think you know the five of us coaches kind of sat down and we reviewed their previous season before we came in the the 2016-17 season um and you know i think one point that you kind of alluded to i remember us during that meeting um was actually their ability to to score points yeah, definitely. I mean, if you look at the season from from 2016-17, so the year before we went there, the the, the the finish ninth in the table, which you know it's a competitive league, York Street. It's tough. Not there's no easy games in it, and they still managed to win the the York Silver Trophy, which is you know the the, the that levels <clears throat> county cup. 
But what was really important was that points scored was 657. So there was there was no issue in terms of them scoring. There was only, I think, two of the teams that actually scored more points than them over the course of that season. What was what was obvious that needed to be worked on was defence. You know, they conceded 511. So there's a big difference there in terms of the if they were scoring lots of points, but also leaking lots of points. If we could tighten that and lower that that number, we could easily get their marginal gains in terms of a few extra wins there. So that just needed some you know, work that what the problem was with that. Was it a commitment to tackling? Was it an understanding of a structure? And just, just to tweak that a little bit to, to, to get that down. And that's, I think that's, a, that's, an, that's an important point. You know, if we can, if you can, I know as you progress up the chain and you get to, to the more elite level, you'll be able to watch footage from the year before to actually get to understand the players. But simply looking at the last year's, um, looking at the previous year's uh, table actually gives a good indication of what of, of where they're strong and like you know, like you alluded to the, the the attack was was pretty was pretty spot on but the defense was a bit leaky now you know we can then go and speak to the players and say right is it a technical aspect or is it a tactical aspect um so it really does begin to, to start opening opening those questions and um yeah for so one year one year later um what happened, Chris? What what happened? Well, you know, we, we managed to got 652 points, so we were still that attacking threat that they'd been the year before. Um, but actually, we'd reduced the number of points conceded to 278. So, you know, I mean, I, I think that averaged over the course, if you include the Twicken run in that as well, I think we averaged 11 points a game conceded. And that was, you know, we didn't really do... We just put in a, a, a system, really, more than anything, of, of everyone understanding, knowing what to do there. But we'll, we'll do that a little bit later on. So that resulted, anyway, in us getting, you know, we finished second in the league, so we qualified for promotion that way. But we also won the, as we've alluded to in the other episodes, we won the Yorkshire RF, well, the, the RFU Silver uh, Junior Vase uh, at Twickenham. Um, so what we want to do now, and, and again, this is sort of now we've outlined that context, is talk about what that what we did to achieve that and the process that we went to and everything within that aligns back to what we spoke about through every single episode so far on, on this season is that who, what and how and processes that you can do and you can take away just kind of mirror that in your own environment. But I think that the main caveat to add is what works for who in what circumstance and why. So yes, this worked for us. Think about how you can adapt it and use it to get the best out of it in your environment. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. And as and as we progress now on to um, talking about how we actually kind of created created our own curriculum, um, you know, this a lot of these examples, you know, might work, might directly work in your in your environment, but some might need tweaking, and then some might might simply not just work. But you know, if you understand your participants as well as uh, you know uh, as well as you need to, you'd be able to get a good 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 gist of that, very much good gist of that. Yeah, and, and that's how you then you shape the curriculum. Because the, the, the key thing, I mean, the main thing, my vision at the start of when, when I started this project and then got Steve and, and Harrison involved with it and we, we made it a, a bigger project was I really wanted to try and make that professional environment, but with a vision that aligns to the wants and needs of an, of an amateur player and the amateur level. Because I think you described it best, actually, Harrison, was it was professional with a small p. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and how we can then take that and build that into an environment that makes them players thrive. And that comes down to, to, to what we spoke about all the way through is understanding the wants and needs of the learner, understanding the curriculum, and then understanding the types of activity that we can do around that. So we spoke about this um, loosely, I think, in episode one was how we, we went around and understood the learners and um understand what they need so it goes back to understand the, the 10 questions that, that we ask them straight off the bat is you know first of all find out which players were playing in that squad that gives an indication of the number of players that we had what they liked about the club what did they like about training and what did they want to re remain the same what did they think needed changing any worries concerns the strengths of the team and that's a really important one getting them to reflect on the strengths of, the, of, of, of what the squad had from previous seasons and what they think the weaknesses are and see if it aligned to what the league table actually already showed us in terms of what our interpretations were. Um, what their playing style was, did they enjoy the way they played? Did they want to see that adapt as well? What they felt the vision of the club could be, I think, you know, 
community clubs are, are very interesting because you've got the committee at the top, you've got the coaches, and then you've got the players, and all of them need to be travelling in the same direction. Everyone's vision needs to be the same, and you've touched on that in episode one, Harrison, around you know understanding the wants and needs of the committee above is important because they're then going to direct how well and how effective you can be in achieving the rest of it. Yes. Yeah, well, look, look, you know, like, like we said before, um, you know, especially at especially at an amateur level, um, for a committee, it sometimes it's more important just to get good numbers through the door to training on a Tuesday and a Thursday, just so they can keep you know just to keep the bar takings bar takings up because you know, that's the lifeblood that for, for that club it might be the lifeblood, whereas you know some clubs might be a little bit more ambitious and want to progress on up. So these these, these ten questions not only could they go out to, uh, to to your players but also those key members. Um, key members and the stakeholders above, uh, you know, just just to see where you know, just so you do get that that that, that linear that linear idea of right. Everyone in the club is on this is on the same boat. We want to go in this direction. This is the this is the voyage that we're going to take. Um, can we get everyone on board with that? And then yeah. if you can't, then you've got to think about ways in which that can happen. Definitely, it, it links in. I read um, uh, uh, you win the locker room first. And, and in there, it, it talks about culture and, and John Gordon wrote that, but he's also written a book called The Energy Bus. Within that, he talks about, you know, if you've got people coming onto your bus and you need everyone going to be happy to be going to the destination that you want to be going, because any negative energy within that, um, he calls them energy vampires, takes the bus off course, changes the direction that it's going in. So it's really important that from, from the committee to the, players to even you know some of the spectators you know everyone's got an opinion of what you're doing and if you're not doing it very well they're the first ones on the sideline to tell you or even in the bar afterwards get all them on the bus going in the right direction because that's what's going to make it make it work yes oh, oh oh totally and you know i think these 10 questions very much very much enabled us as coaches um you know to be able to gain that understanding from both from above uh and working alongside the players, I think what was interesting, the way you moved on to it next was, um, I can't, I, I can't remember the name of the app that you used, um, where the players were able to log on and, and you'd ask them questions and they'd write keywords, and the more the keywords are written across the apps, the bigger they, the bigger, the bigger they came up on the screen. So it was a great like visual tool for the players to kind of like sync in together. Um, I think you can, oh, I can't, for the life of me, I can't remember what the app's called now. You've, you've, you've caught me off the off guard here because I actually cannot run the life me either. Um, but I'll, uh, I, will, I will try and find that out. Um, but you're right, it, it, that gives people the, the live information because as it's coming up on the screen, they can see it. Um, and it, and it's, be, it's, it's just like a quiz thing, really, that people can upload in and that the words come up quite quickly. And here's just some of the examples of some of the things that we, we, we came up with. Obviously, the words that are in big letters are the ones that was mentioned the most. So training, structure, playing style, defence, depth, game understanding were some of the ones that they wanted to see more in terms of how the team could develop and improve. What they liked about the club, and this was really important, I think, was that it was friendly, the atmosphere was good, the environment, the, how, how enjoyable it was. So one thing I think was unique with, with Otley is there's two clubs in Otley. It's a small town, but there's two clubs in Otley, and everyone that's at all the Enzians is is local. There are a lot of the lads went to school together, so they've already got a relationship with each other. There's already a, a culture embedded because they've, they've all got a similar journey to get there, which makes it a lot easier when they, they have got that good rapport. Um, but what was really clear more than anything is everyone realised that they 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 had that potential to be promoted to the league above. They they wanted to get on the bus and travel in that direction to, to be successful with promotion, but then also because of the Twickenham carrot, which does help in terms of adding that extra layer of commit, uh, commitment, they wanted to get to Twickenham and, and play in that final final there as well. So the 10 questions really highlighted to the coaching staff that actually we've got an exciting opportunity here to have an impact on this club and, like I said, get it going in, in the direction that it needed to be. Yes, and I think you know, we were, you know, I think for us as coaches, we were our eyes lit up and we, you know, we knew that we were in a we we're in a good place at the start of the season when these keywords were coming up, when we did see the keywords of promotion, um, Twickenham, um, defence, playing style, you know, that means they they really wanted to engage within that process of first of all becoming 
better rugby players individually, which we wanted to go in there and do as coaches. I know that I did personally, but then also create a better um, team team playing style as well. And you know, for us, I think that was a really big wake up call at the start of the season. I know that my uh, for me personally, when I was seeing this, which really got me excited for the season ahead because they were they were they were aligned with what what we were what we were going in with now i know that people <laughs> some coaches aren't as fortunate with us on that um you know sometimes you know i know I've, I've been in environments myself in which me as either a player or as a coach has wanted to progress on that whereas the club or the coach itself might be you know happy with where they are um but yeah the, for us for that season it was it was, it was the golden egg, I think, wasn't it, Chris? Yeah, but, but on that, you also get the other side of the coin where the committee have a completely false view of what should be happening in terms of what they've got available to get them where they be. So the vision doesn't align with actually the reality of what there is in front of you. And I think that's why this task is really important because I think this is going back using John Gordon's analogy as well. The, the, the downside an amateur club has got is you can't give anyone off the bus if they don't share your vision because you might not have any players left. So that's where, as a as a as a coach, it's not just what you're delivering in terms of output on the field. It's how well you can work with these players on the sideline. Now, I think reflecting back that if we hadn't got these answers the way that we had, our season one would have probably been completely different. Because I think my job as the head coach then would have been to try and get everyone back in, involved in bought into that plan, which meant I probably wouldn't have done much coaching. I would have done more people management and then we would have probably seen the, the the positive elements 12 months later so there is a different strategy that you can go on and a different path if you don't get these results straight away you just have to then reshape your long-term plan because you might have to move things around for it to fit and i think that's important to, to sort of understand yeah I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more chris there i couldn't agree with you more but I think, but I also think, just quickly, is that that's that's one bit that people forget about. You know that sometimes you, and that's the but I put a team together that I knew I trusted, which meant that we all worked together. That if I needed to go off and do something that wasn't necessarily on the training field, that that you and Quinny were good enough, experienced enough, and intelligent enough to do the job and to do it well and to trust you to do your job. And it goes back to what sort of Colin alluded to, I think on the last one is just having that trust to, to, to do your job. That's, that's your job. Go and, go and do it. Um, and I think if you're in a situation where the, the views are slightly different, you don't just walk away with it. You've got to work with people to get them in the direction that you want them to go. And that might take time. And it's that, it's how much time are you willing to commit to make it work? Yeah. And, uh, and definitely. And uh, as you know, I think you and I are, are first to admit. I think Quinny, if Quinny would, would also be first to admit, and I think Pato as well. Um, you know, we we did have different different differing views on on certain things. You know, but it's important for us as coaches and and that, and that trust in in each other, not just the head coach trusting trusting his assistants, but also me as an assistant coach being able to trust um, you know Pato when he's working with the backs, or you know when I'm working with the forwards, that he's delivering the best for the backs that will help. With the forwards as well and, and and vice versa you know and this comes beautifully onto you know when we talk about our mental models now we every coach as we've covered in episode four has their own vision and mental model of the game now before we can so at this point we'd understand what the players wanted then we've got us as coaches with four five of us included in, included in tempo all with our own different vision of the game now we needed to sit down and have and have a long chat and and uh, and actually align that so we've got an agreed way of, we, of of how we wanted to play before we can take it to the players before the players can start imprinting it themselves. Yeah, and the key thing is everything that we've spoken about so far happened before a training session for preseason even started. You know, this we were announced to go in in May, so this started from as soon as the announcement was made. This process started, and that involved meeting with. It was me, you, Steve, Pato, uh, Sam Featherston, captain, uh, Alex Murphy, vice captain. Um, brought the medical team involved in them discussions as well to, 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 to ensure that there was that alignment, that clear thinking. And we're not going to go straight into sort of going in about our mental models again because we've got a whole, <laughs> whole episode already to that. So if you need to listen back on that and you've not listened to it already, go back to, to episode four, hear about the building of that mental model. 
um, and that then will add clarity to, to what we're about to, to sort of move on to of, of what that looked like in reality. Yeah, so then our next step was that. So we've come, you know, we, we've shared our mental models. We were, you know, I think uh, us as coaches and Sam and, uh, and, and Alex Murphy, we, you know, we liked that idea of splitting up the pitch into the three key areas. Um, but then we wanted to take that a step further. And what do those three key areas look like? Um, so we agreed upon that the final third was the green zone. That's where, you know, if, you, you know, if you're on the YouTube, you can see a, a nice visual here. You know, we've got a key areas of, the, of there would be scoring, creating scoring opportunities, and then from a defensive perspective, present, uh, preventing exits and creating turnover chances. Now, those three key areas in the green then began to to create sessions. So those sessions, so those key areas, what you can, what, what we're talking about now, and what you can see, are almost the title. We call I call it the title, the title of our of our session. Um, so even if you move further down, so you know, we'll look at an example later on where you know, creating um, advancing the ball forward in the amber was the theme of that of a Tuesday session, um, and actually having an infographic like this, you know, enabled us as coaches to go right. You know, the head coach um, Chris, you'd you'd watch the game on Saturday. You go right this week. I think for for in terms of working within our curriculum it's got to be advancing the ball forward in the amber. So therefore we then know as assistant coaches, right, how can we align that? Um, and we can then, but that then formed the discussions between us and then we'd then uh, create a session plan for, for, for the players. Yeah, so I mean, we, we spoke about with Steve in, in episode six and Joy in, in episode seven around this idea of the curriculum. And what we're giving an example of here is what that scaffolding approach looks like in terms of a curriculum. So, you know, each week we would be covering one of these themes and each one of them themes sort of is underpinned by a, a lot of other different things in terms of outcomes that we would have expected. So in episode four, we spoke about from a defensive point of view, and I think it's important we reference the defence element because we, we talked at the start of, of this one around the number of points that we managed to reduce it down to one of the key targets sort of we agreed as a team was to try and win the ball back in five phases so you know if we're then within a, a defensive structure within the amber you know the objective was manic line speed get off the line put them under pressure force an error and we want to try and win the ball back within that five the same thing if we're in the green you know, in terms of creating turnover chances and preventing exits, if we can get off the line quick, keep that communication and connection, put that pressure on. So, so there's a lot of other things below that sort of underpins every element of, of these key themes to, to make them work. Yeah, and I think you mentioned a good, a good, a good word there, Chris, in terms of scaffold. Um, you know, when we look at a curriculum, we want to, we want to layer it on each time we revisit. So, you know, we can't, as coaches as you know we can't just go right we've had three sessions now on um defensive structures in the amber let we, we tick that off you know the, the more appropriate way of doing it would be right we're going to start with an entry point at the bottom of of what that might look like real basic form of can we keep a connected line now the next time we it might be three four weeks down the line but the next time we re, re, we revisit we can build upon those same scaffolds so therefore you've got a so you've got a nice scaffolding that's eventually climbing up you can use this as a visual here up, up up that channel and then by the end of it by the time by the end of the season we're up we're we're at game mode we're at, we're at the top of that we've reached the top of the scaffold and we we then all the players are on the same hymn sheet we all understand everything that's gone below and we're and we're firing on all cylinders at that point yeah, it's trying to uh, trying to organise that recall so that the players can take ownership of it themselves, and and that's when they're going to be more empowered to make more intuitive decision decisions Ex on the field. Exactly. Um, yeah, so now we're going to look at you know, we, we've spoken about how we've created this curriculum and how we got to this point. Um, I think we're just going to go into a bit of an example of of, of how we implemented that across uh, across a working a working week. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that, that was quite powerful for myself and, and Harrison from the Masters was this idea of a coaching toolbox analogy. And we touched on that um, earlier in the series around how, you know, uh, all bits of coaching, all the bits of learning that you do, you gather in these key things, these key tools. We need to know sort of how to use them in a practical context. 
it's a you know it's the equivalent of a plumber turning up your house with a spanner but not actually knowing how to repair the boiler it, it's how do you then use the tools that you've got and align them to that vision of right these are what my participants want they're these these are what their wants and needs these are the demands of the sport what is the goal what is the 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 objective what am i trying to achieve right now i open my toolbox and what coaching tools in terms of practice structures am i going to use to to bring the best out of these players and bring to life everything that i've established within my my who and my what yes and you know and and the more that we kind of experience uh, in our coaching in our coaching journey the more um we self-reflect on our own coaching practices the more you listen to quality podcasts um the more tools you're going to you, you're going to gather so these experiences and these and these processes of, of of being on this on this journey of coaching and it is a journey because you know i don't think one coach can ever say that they've fully completed coaching i don't think you can ever i don't think well i think some people have claimed they've completed coaching but i think they're talking out of a different orifice to one that's on the on their on their face um but on that you know even someone i, I remember um 11 years ago, I was here at Beckett for a, a coach's breakfast and Stuart Lancaster was doing a talk on philosophy. And one of his first slides that he put up was the number of miles that he had done in his job because he was sort of running the England Academy structure then before he got the England job. And he realised that that's how many miles he'd done. Every one of them miles needed to be a learning moment. So that's when he got listening to audio books. He got listening to, to things that he could use to keep his brain ticking over because you used to end up spending i think it was like seventy six thousand miles in like a couple of years there's a lot of miles to do in a year if you're not engaging your mind differently rather than just listening to you know a radio station you can you're expanding your knowledge and you expand your knowledge that's when you're going to get better results and and that helped then shape when he then got the england job around the culture and the leadership he then put into practice everything that you learned in all them years driving the car up and down to every academy in the country so it's how will we apply this learning to shape that toolbox to really put into practice when we get into that environment spot on spot on and you've got to be really open-minded with that process and sometimes even admit that some of your tools might be a bit faulty um you know this is where a good open discussion with other coaches either assistant coaches or or just or just friends and colleagues will you know can can help and, and help you along that journey um but yeah, the more more we can kind of take in, more we can learn, and the more then we the more we can try these tools and see which ones work and see which ones don't. See which ones don't. So this this sort of brings us on to really what what the average working week like what, what working week was like. So just just most rugby clubs within reason train Tuesday Thursday game Saturday. That's usually how how the average rugby amateur rugby structure sort of looks like. So we tried to sort of break that down into what would happen on each day. So uh, eight thirty to quarter past nine would sort of be an opportunity for the lads to come down, and work on individual skills. All the coaches were there to help. The gym was open. Um, well, what we had as a, of a gym was open that they could go down and do some stuff, and if they wanted to, that that was optional. But we found that there was quite a big uptake in it. I think you know fresh new faces, new environment, you know, new ideas. People were enthused to come down and, you know, work on some individual skills. Then on a Tuesday, what we started to do, and this is more in season rather than in pre-season, we, we looked at the review of the Saturday. Um, and we'll talk about what that review looked like a little bit later. The lads would then sort of warm up half seven till quarter to eight. And then we get into sort of the, the, the meat and bones of the training session. So then that would go till around half past eight, quarter to nine. And this is sort of where we would look at the condition games and each one of them games will be linked to a theme. So there's a lot of stuff around sort of games and teaching games, but we'll come on to sort of what ours specifically look like a little bit later. But I think the important point to add is that each game that we coach related back to what we were trying to achieve within our curriculum and the scaffolding that we'd had that was aligned to our mental model. So each game related to an area of the field, each game related to a desired outcome, which the players had been involved in the process of creating. You know, there was no, you must do this. We weren't taking decisions away from players. They were, they had an idea of what needed to be done where, but how they executed that, they were free to explore within a training environment. Um, 
Yes, and I think that's I think, you know, when we talk about scaffolding and uh, and and our, and, our, and our playing structure, it was very much a framework more than anything. Um, you know, these these are these are players that you know from an attacking perspective, we already know that they've got great attacking potential due to due to looking at the statistics from last year, um, where we might need to be a little bit more, you know, a little bit more explicit and and more direct with. It might be some of the defensive stuff if they're they were struggling with, you know. So, you know, I think. It, it, it is that balance. It's no one, 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 one boot fits all. Um, yeah. So it's. I think what worked for us in our in our context was having that outer framework for them to to, to feel free to play within, but they had that understanding that, that that critical tactical understanding that you know, for example, if you overplay within ten meters of our own try line, the likelihood of them to get a turnover and scoring a try is. It just grows and grows and grows. So, what resources have we got to get out of there? Um, so, I think that's that's just an important note. I just wanted to add there, Chris. Yeah, no, no, you, you're right. And then on the Thursday, we very much had a similar format, apart from rather than a review, we had a preview, uh, and then we brought in something called Picking Thursday, which was something that again that sort of um, like a magpie, sort of something shiny. It was sort of mentioned as an idea on the Masters from um, from one of the lecturers, Bob, of stuff that he'd done with with, in, with the England hockey coaches, where Basically, the Thursday session was fully led by the players in terms of they could come up, once we'd identified stuff within the preview, they could come up with the game and the structure that we wanted to put into that night's themed game. So it related to, you know, they had to be creative with the type of game that they came up with. They could align the objectives to what we'd outlined in the preview. Um, And then we were there basically just to observe and give feedback and help when we were asked to be involved. So we're still giving the players that empowerment of, well, this is the framework. This is what we've got to work with. How best can we put that into practice for um, for the Saturday? And that wasn't just like some, I think, you know, a lot, some people might associate that with just a captain's run. And it was more than that because the, the players were encouraged to start off with a game. You know, even if it was, if we had 20 players, even if it was 10 v 10, you know, what, what were we looking for within that game that we want to try and see them bring to life on the Saturday? And they refereed it themselves. They came with the rules themselves, but the objectives aligned to what we'd outlined in the preview. So they had full ownership of that session, and it was an opportunity for them to start thinking and prepare for what could come up when we got into that Saturday game. Yes, yeah, and, that, and yeah, uh, yeah, and I think you know, the majority of the time they probably did get full autonomy, but there's you know there's a couple of, I think a couple of times we may have to. We just had to rein it in in terms of our expectations, and this is where this is where it's really important that you build those good relationships with the players, that you can have those conversations, that we can, you know, make sure that we are still aligned. And I think majority of the times they, you know, they they understood it pretty well. Um, I think there was only a couple of times in which we had to go, hang on a second there. The hardest bit was at the very start because it was completely new, it was alien to them that oh, yeah. you want me to do this? I don't, I don't get what's going on. And, and that's the hardest bit. And, and what what some people do then is just stop. Well, this isn't working. But actually, that's, you know, you, to, to create a new habit, to create change, you've got to stick with it. You know, it's, it's, it's messy in the middle. It's hard at the start, messy in the middle. And it gets, you know, towards the end, it's, it's where you need it to be. The only way you can get good at something is through practicing it. So, you know, to actually, if you're thinking, oh, I quite like the idea of that thinking Thursday, it will not work at the start how you imagine it in your head and it'll be hard and you'll probably end up, I think at the start we did have to, you know, guide them towards where we needed to be. But when it works, it, it works well because players have, have, have got such more clarity of not only the expectations more for themselves, but of the game plan that you've all been involved in creating and how to bring it to life most effectively. Yeah. And definitely, and also I think just just reiterate as well on that Thursday we typically do a, a unit session within that in which forwards are going to do their lineouts and scrums and and backs comb their hair and I don't know um, they do something <laughs> they do something yeah. so that sort of brings on to what these condition games look like now there's there's all sorts of research there around game sense is is the is the way forward and the RFU have got a, a lot of content out there now from an England rugby perspective around 
you know, coach do games, why is it important? And they have their games on, skills on, and how you can use them most effectively. They've also got cards, so you can encourage creativity, awareness, resilience, decision making. What was the last one? Self organization. Self organization. There we go. We got there eventually. Tell it's been a while since I've delivered any form of our review course. Um, but the, the, you know, that is all content that you can go back about back and use. But essentially, creating games helps promote and improve decision making at action. So when they get into the game, are they able to make a decision based on what's happening in front of them? It provides them with independence on the field because they've, they're playing the game. That's what we want. That's why we want to come to training. We don't want to come and stand in lines and pass the ball backwards and forwards. They, you know, they want to play rugby. They want to play a game. So it gives them independence on the field because especially when you align it to the mental model that we spoke about earlier and in episode four, they've got something to align their decision-making process back to. So they're aware of what they need to do, but how they got there on the field could depend on what the outcome was going on in front of them. And then it starts to emerge different patterns of behavior because that's ever changing in a game. You know, teams will react, defend differently. Players will get tired. You know, you've got to try and identify where these weaknesses are. But what we want is players to, you know, successfully achieve specific outcome, which at the end of the day, when you're attacking in rugby is to score. And when you're defending in rugby is to prevent score. What directs how we do that is where we are on the pitch. Um, so that's what we try. That, you know, I think we, we try as coaches to, you know, overcomplicate rugby a bit. Um, but actually, you need clear alignment of, you know, what do we want to see in attack? What do we want to see in defence? Essentially, the objective is to stop them from scoring in defence and to score more points than them in attack. And, you know, how do we identify the strengths and weaknesses of an opposition to be able to get to that successful outcome? Yes. And, and, and you know, I think with you know, with the condition games, it's where you know, you, the players are, are being faced with greater greater number of decisions. They have, they're forced into more game-based, um, game-realistic scenarios. And actually, us as coaches, through our session design and, and, and game design in particular, we can highlight, we can really emphasize and, and highlight certain areas of, of which we want to do that by introducing you know, those constraints um, or, you know, enabling uh, the RFU, the superpowers and, and, things like, and things like that. But they've got to make sure that they're aligned back to the key themes that we've discussed and created within our, within, within our curriculum. Yeah, so, I mean, if you just reflect back, to, to sort of the type of game design that we had is, is in the middle part of the field in attack. We really wanted to emphasize on, on width so that the key things that we broke off from a game design point of view was we split the game, in, the game, the pitch down into three areas and we emphasized the players where we were on the field. And the objective was to, you couldn't get touched in the same section of the field twice. So it was a double touch game. So on the first touch, you could carry on going forward. On the second touch, replicated a bit more of a slower play. So that would be the rook. Um, and then it would how well they self-organized and moved. So could they get the next few things? So we've, we've got width, we've got depth to make that work, but then did they have two sides, two lines? So each side of the breakdown was the two sides of attack with two lines to try and make sure that we can um, effectively hit the space on the outside. Because we're pushing them wide, we want to attack outside their defender. So could we move people around? Um, and then we emphasize that point of trying to get fourth phase for a positive outcome. And that positive outcome could be anything from, you know, just a line break or eventually the penultimate is to, to score would be the, 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 the preferred outcome, positive outcome. So that's how we structured that game. And the players would then reflect back to them key points. So uh, if, if, they were, if they were touched within, if they were touched twice within a certain area, it was a turnover, so they had to play. Because that was emphasizing that they weren't attacking outside their defender. Could they then, uh, if, if they then maybe played the middle, but went highlighted a positive that there was a gap on the outside and went to play for it. So they called for it and played, it was the right decision, but they may have only just got as far as the 15, just play on in that situation because you're rewarding that they've recognized where the space was and played towards it. So it's, it's how you differentiate the game to emphasize them key points of attack. So, and it's still in comp including what we wanted to see in that part of the field to play with width. Yes. Yeah, and, 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 you know, and us as coaches, we're gi we've given them tools to, to be able to do that. Um, yeah, and that goes back to um, you know, creating you know, those, those common languages. So we have our, you know, we, you know, we had our kings and our queens, queens playing off of nine, kings playing off of 10 to really be able to stretch that defence. So you know, the players, you know, they had those tools, but then they also then became 
began through our conditioned games, um, began to gain an understanding of how, how that actually looks within, within, within a game scenario. Definitely, and that goes back to sort of, I mean, there's loads of stuff out there around, you know, game sense, teaching games for understanding, but essentially you've got the learners at the centre, so the activity is, is learner-centred, it's they're at the heart of everything. You've then got the game, you know, you get them to develop that tactical awareness of where they are, how they're going to play, um, what to do where, how to do it, and making them appropriate decisions, and the best way to do that is through games. Coaching through games will allow them to put their skills under pressure because it's replicating a game. It's then giving them feedback on that skill execution as well. So, you know, if a kick is then, if someone tries to do a kick out of the, the amber, which is perfectly allowed, it's a good method to try and get that game territory and go forward, but it's charged down. The immediate feedback that they're getting is, I was too flat. I wasn't deep enough to give myself time to execute that kick. Um, if I then got caught offside, well, I didn't give myself enough depth to make sure I was onside when the, the kick was made. The players get immediate feedback from the game that can help shape them rather than it just coming from the coaches. So coaching through games is a massive tool that coaches can use. And there's, like I said earlier, there's loads of different ways that you can adapt games. What I would really emphasize for you to do with this is to make sure that the, your, you understand the game that you're doing. You're planning your constraints aligned to your understanding of the sport, your players and what you want to get out of that rather than just, you know, run things on the off the cuff or turning up and just sort of facilitating activity be clear about what your objectives are and what you want to get out of it and how does that relate to how you want to play the game and one thing to emphasize here is that's not massively over structuring players and telling them what to do where you can still stand back coach and allow them to make decisions based on what's happening in front of them give them that freedom don't over structure it give them the freedom to play and give feedback on the outcome that then comes for it but then that goes back to what Steve McEwen was saying in episode six, where we can go in and we can step in as coaches at that point and ask, you know, what did you see there? What informed that decision that you made? And that's where that feedback process comes in for us as coaches. So we're understanding what they've seen. And then we can then give them, you know, we can assist with them in their learning of what could they have done in that, within that example. You know, so if, if, that, if that one didn't work, well, now why didn't it work? Or why did you see that? Why, what, what, what did you see to inform that decision? And then what, what other decisions, what other actions can you do based on that decision that you made? Uh, you know, and that's, you know, that, and that was a quite a poignant point that Steve made in episode six and and Joe Kane uh, in episode seven. Yeah, I, I'm really big on on using the word describe to me now because describe to me what shaped that decision there. Because the player, and you alluded it to it in Steve's episode as well, as well, around that positioning and where we stand, you can't see everything as a coach. If someone's made a decision, you need to know why they've made that decision. So getting them to describe what happened in that process gives you the feedback on what they've seen. Because actually, it might not have been the desired outcome that you wanted, but actually it was the right decision based on the information that that player was getting. Yeah, and actually and being clear with them. Sorry, and actually being and actually being clear with them, and actually asking them to be really descriptive, go into as much detail as you can within that describe, even if you don't think it's, even if you you know the player might not perceive that to be important information, if that if they if they're thinking of that during during that description process, keep it in there because that allows us to get oh, to even to to widen our our perception and our vision of what they of what they have just seen there, and gain that understanding. And that's what's really critical with breaking down that that wall in between what I'm seeing as a coach and what they're seeing as a player. Yeah, I think too many times people turn to us to always have the answers when we, we don't. <laughs> we don't. The, the players made the decision based on what they've seen. So therefore, in a, in a lot of the time, we have to trust the judgment that they've made based on what they've seen. But to do that, we need to understand what it is they've gone through in that process to make that decision. Because that is the most important bit because then you can start thinking okay that's what we've seen relate that back to what we've done in terms of our scaffolding and our mental model how does that fit within there well actually yeah the, the, the thought process is actually in the right area but maybe skill execution was a problem maybe it was another element that, that you can start aligning that to to then find out what, how you fix that problem if there was a problem that had come from it yeah um, and, and speak to your players don't just always feel as though you need to have the answers for everything because you don't <laughs> to be honest 
Yeah, spot on. And as you know, and as we're discussing this, you know, you know this work, you know, working with the players and uh, and that reflective process and what we can do as coaches. I think it's you know, and we we also allude to to scaffolding as well. This is just an example of 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 how, what that looked like across uh, across a pre season. Yeah, so each one of them themes had, uh, each one of them games had a specific theme linked to what we were trying to get to in terms of attacking framework, linked to transition, uh, defining moments of the attack. And we're starting to layer on the, the, the mental model bits that we've got here. And, and as you'll see that we've got recall sessions in there. Now, them recall sessions were, were majority player-led. So that first one, the aim was to try and get around 50% recall based on the themes that we'd spoken about in week one. How much could the players remember? So the first part of that session, we, we turned up and said, right, guys, we're going to start with a game that we finished with on, on Tuesday last week. How much can you remember? Off you go. Go into teams, get yourselves organised, and then go and play. And again, similar to like that thinking Thursday, it, didn't, it was messy. It didn't work as well as it did as it could have done it to start with but it's it's pre-season so we want errors to make we want to assess how much the players have learned and that's where we stand there and go okay so they've got this that's good we can put a tick on that what can we look to develop on next and that's when so in that session there's probably 50 percent recall then we would probably come in and start layering more stuff that we've spoken about over the previous week um and, and build it up that way so the recall sessions align back to what you, you've sort of spoken to within your mental model and the themes that you're looking at doing and how much the players can remember and giving them the autonomy to show how much they've learned, show what they've been able to get out of that session plan and, and do they align to the objectives, uh, which you can see at the top, for, for that particular part of the cycle. Yes, and you know those recall sessions also allow, allow us to go in and, and, and check in Check in with the players without, you know, not talking to them. You know, can they actually go out there and deliver and recall everything that we, we we have already covered? And if they haven't, right, let's go back and revisit. If they have, let's layer it on. We're moving on, baby. We're moving on. And from a from a coaching perspective, that's where I would say to to you or Steve, right, guys, this is the plan this week. Harrison, can you come up with an activity for this around go forward and support? Quick, you look at this element as well. And, and that's how then you, you're you organising the tasks based on how the week's organised um, so that you're sharing the workload in coaching so that you can rotate around between right, who's going to be observing, seeing what's going on and who's going to be in the mixer doing the, the main bit of coaching because co-coaching is a, a hard skill in itself um, and, you know, I'm still still learning it now, you know, still make errors with it. Um, so it's that's a that's a process to get into which which isn't covered on this plan, but it's it's another skill that coaches need to be aware of if they're going to put it into their practice. So yeah, that's um pretty spot on there, Chris. Um yeah, so we we, we touched on we, we touched on in game stuff on field. Um, we looked at the condition games and how we can and how we can build constraints on that. Now we're really going to focus on on how we actually introduce the review structure and what the review structure actually looks like for us um, on a Tuesday post 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 a Saturday game. Um, you know, during this time, I was quite fortunate to be um, uh, an analyst at, at Opta as well. So, you know, I really got really gained some some skills in, in analysts. So, I'm not expecting not expecting everyone um, to have that to have the level of depth that we were able to get to in that in that season. Um, but you know, we've got an example. We've got an example here of you know of of, of doing statistical analysis and actually providing the players with. With key stats on tackles made, tackles missed, um, you know, and whether those tackles are dominant, passive, or or just neutral, um, and the same for the carry and So, how many defenders they may have beaten. Um, I think this was quite. I think the players found this quite a useful tool, didn't they, Chris? Yeah, they did. I think it's important to point out that we, although we got all this information and presented it to the players, it, it very much it didn't really influence much around. Um, selection that much or um, judgment of, of players. We, we, some lads used it as a bit more of an ego trip, especially with the players beat and the dominant tackles, etc. But it didn't really shape much of ours. I mean, if you take, you know, one of our players, if I remember rightly, in, in one game, did manage to hold 10 carries and a total of two metres. But he was still starting player because of what else he brought sort of to the, to, to the team. So although these were tracked, it was more so the players were aware of where they could go to. Um, rather than, you know, a, a, a tool for us to solely base selection on. Although if you're fortunate to have a squad of 
50 odd, then you, you might want to use this data a little bit differently in that respect, I suppose. Isn't that right, Hansen? Yeah, I, I think I think the way we used it was quite was quite good. Um, I think we used it in terms of you know, competition for players. You know, some of them have that golden character to actually try and up work rate, uh, especially for like potentially a back row player at a seven. Um, I think we, we had a nice little competition between two back rowers at, at the club that wanted to try and make more tackles and make more carries, which, you know, I think for, for me and, and for, for like you and, the, and us as other coaches at the club, it was very positive because it started conversations. So if a player missed a certain tackle, we could go, right, look, you've missed four tackles here, but those four tackles are positional misses. So that means they're, they're, they're losing that connection with the defensive line. And we can actually, that's, that then begins that process of working with that player on, the, on an individual level to say, right, how can we get connected? How can we talk and create clarity with our, with our, two, our two defenders either side of us to make sure that we're not giving away those gaps, giving away those positional misses? And also, if, if they're being bumped off, then, right, what technical element of the tackle can we as coaches help you with to gain more competency within, within that tackle? So, yeah... It, it was a bit of fun, and I know that the lads absolutely. We, we the lads at the end, we played um, a higher or lower game, didn't we? In which end of season dinner created created good laughs, and, and you know, we really it's, we really try and trivialise statistics. Um, but then you know, it, 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 I think it grew to be quite important for us at the same time. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I've been sort of teaching on um, with the students at the moment on the undergrad is around sort of identifying them them critical features of like certain skills and coaching points that you'd want around that and and what you've touched on there is exactly that this this is an opportunity for us to identify some some common themes or some critical features with how we worked as a, a unit and identify where their potential weaknesses were and help up skill players to get to the levels they needed to in in specific areas so yes we wouldn't use these these statistics as actual as actual you know these are basically be an extra a, a bonus to to what the main meat the main nitty gritty of what our video review structure is, uh, which you know which I'm going to touch on now. Um, so well, I mean, there's lots of different ways in which you can do um, video review, and I'm not I think don't think either of us are saying this is this is the way, um, but I think for us this 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 kind of work this kind of work for us. Um, you know, um, I don't mind you know. A lot of clubs will just put a video up and they'll sit there and they'll discuss and talk about key moments with the video playing in the background. Now, if that works for you, that, 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 that's fine. Um, but for us as coaches, we want to go into a bit, little bit more depth in, in certain areas and, and how that really ties back into, into our, our game plan and how we wanted the players to play on the pitch. Um, you know, so what we created was um, a bit of a video review booklet um, in which each video review session we'd have six clips, three in attack, um, three in defence, um, each clip lasting no longer than between 30 to 60 seconds. Um, and what we'd do during that clip is we'd, we'd pause it and then we'd say, right, what's the intended outcome for this next phase? How do we win this next phase, whether it's attacking or whether it's defensive? And then the players would have a discussion with, the, with amongst themselves. They'd you know, they, they've come up with ideas of you know how we would successfully win the next phase using our key terminologies. So if it's right, we need to, we're at an edge here. Um, so playing off a ten would have a king. So they might go, we're on an edge. We want to play to king because there's space in, in in midfield. You know, that's how they talk about winning that next phase. Um, once that's once they've once we've come and had that discussion, we then press play. So we'll actually play that next phase. And sometimes it was a success, sometimes it was an error um, or a learning moment. We then write, that, I get them to write them down, write it down in the booklet. What was the actual outcome? And then we discuss the key differences between the actual outcome and the intended outcome. Um, and I think the players really began to buy into this. Do you not? Do you not? Do you not think, Chris? Yeah, because it was something a bit a bit different and, and it allowed them, and again, one of the things that we're touching on with all this stuff that we're, we're introducing here is around that players being, sort of having that understanding of what they want to try and achieve where, and then they've kind of got, I suppose, especially with this bit, the accountability, because we're aware that when you're in the, the heat of the moment, you're, you're there in battle, you 
you make decisions based on what happens in front of you. And some people might argue that the, the stuff we're talking about in terms of mental models and, and ideas of where things are, you know, how the pitch influences where we play and how we might play might be the other structure, but it, it's not. It's You need to be able to fully understand the game to be able to tactically execute certain elements of it. And I think the more players engage with reflection of understanding the decisions that are being made and what they're sort of processing in that that moment is such a powerful learning tool than just doing it out on the field because they're actually witnessing it themselves and then reflecting on it. And, you know, you could just watch rugby on the telly to get a general understanding, but I know that even as a coach, you end up engaged watching it as a spectator, as a fan than actually understanding the process and the decision-making that you're make, that players are making in this specific moment. So, for example, if we played a clip, and we, we, we know what had happened before the clip came up because we'd obviously watched it beforehand. So we know what the desired outcome is, but that player then might give us a, a detailed interpretation of actually what they saw in that moment themselves, and this is why that decision happened. So although it wasn't necessarily the desired outcome, we gained an understanding of the decision that they made and why. But we also gain an understanding of, of the players' understanding as well, because they're in that discussion. It's very much a very much, it's very much a player-led discussion in which the players are coming up with solutions to the problem they currently face. And this goes back to um, this idea around you know, what is it, reflective practice. Um, and actually, they're, you know, as, as players who are, are playing, are basically they're, they're like learners. And as a learner, when do you learn most? That's when your your curiosity is is spiked. You, you're curious to know the outcome. You're curious to know the solution to, to, to said problem. Now, the, the issue is with with reflective practice is that we can reflect in the action. So when the players are playing, they they know they might have caught the ball and passed it, and it's been intercepted. Now that's reflecting in, in action because they've made they've made that judgment. They've made that judgment as they've looked at it. And they have to give the pass, and they've got an instant feedback. That feedback is, is is instant. Whereas, right, how can how can we now use the video review process to actually create a stronger, you know, moment of learning within there for them to say, right, I made that decision because of X, Y, and Z. But what other options have I got? What other options should I should I have had? And what needs to be done? for me to feel confident enough to execute the options that I do have and for players around me to get into the right positions to have the options I should have had. So it's, you know, I think, and the way that we structured the video review booklet and process was, you know, was to, was to try and provoke that sense of curiosity by taking away the outcome before actually knowing what it was so they so that they're having to think about right some of them might have good 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 memory and remember what happened but they won't remember it to to enough detail to see it on a video so that so you know can they come up with different outcomes that that, that may work for that, for that for that problem i mean yeah and, and I, I we saw this actively live as, as the bonus that it had and how it improved the the understanding of the game i think what would be quite interesting harrison is you you covered a lot of this as part of your your dissertation for your masters, and use this as sort of a a bit of a template, this reflection element. Can you sort of? I think it'd be beneficial for the listeners to get an understanding of, of what you found through sort of doing that process, because although it's easy for me and you to sit here and say it, I think it'd be interesting to know what what the findings were, why you actually undertook this as a bit of research. Yeah. So I'm. Um... The first few weeks of us of, of, of rolling this this process out, it was, you know, it probably was a bit of a struggle. It was it was new to a lot of players, um, and especially within the environment that we we're working with at um, Old Otley Indians. And actually, encouraging. First of all, it's getting. I found it. I, I found reflecting back on what we did was that the players probably found it a little bit difficult. I think turning up to a rugby session and having a time indoors and actually appreciating the power of of, of off field. Um, so those first two weeks, it was it's, it's getting us. It was, I thought it was getting us getting those players on board that this is a process which will which will benefit them. Um, a process which you know 
will aid performance on the pitch. Um, and then what I found in those first few weeks was it was a bit it was a bit jaded. So the information that they were noting down about what the differences between what they need to be doing, what actions they're going to take in order for them to reach desired, was very limited. So they wouldn't write down much detail about what what, what the scenario was, and that and that showed in those first few weeks of training. But as they as this process became more familiar to them, they were able to note down more more and more detail within within their booklets, and you could tell that that was benefiting them on the pitch because they were able to pick up and actually reflect a little bit quicker in action on on the field. So when a player may have made an error or a moment of misjudgment, we could go, I think yourself, myself, um, Quinny or Pato would go up to the player and ask them. And they'd probably, actually, I think they gave us a much greater detail of answer because of the reflective practice and the reflective stuff we've done off the field. I don't know, uh, um, is that something that you felt that when you were talking to them at the time that that developed over those over the, over that time? Yeah, they became more aware of what was going on around them, and and that's you know I suppose that, that that's a big battle that we're trying to do. Like you said, one of the key roles we should have as coaches is to spark curiosity and encourage them to, you know, not uh, you know I wonder what why certain things have, have happened. And like you said, we when we when they were watching that back and reflecting on the game and then going out onto training, they're actually thinking, oh, actually, I've done this, but that might have been a better option based on this picture that I had at the time. So, it, one, it allowed them to reflect, but then it also allowed us, because of the stronger detail and answer that they were given, they could give us a more better understanding of what they'd actually seen during that session to, to, to make the decisions that they made. And like you say, reflection is a, is a key part of learning we learn through doing but we need to know what well, i suppose what is it why is it no it's sort of the justification the reason that sparked that decision that we made yeah it's, it's about rambled then about stuff <laughs> no it's it's understanding that why and it is it's understanding you know why have we made that decision what has informed us about making that decision and you know why have we acted in that way and sometimes it's you know we, it's instinctive and we have to you, you're doing it straight away but then sometimes it's, it can be a little bit more thought out and we can look to, ex and look to execute um, but I think you know like I said it, it what, what really came clear is that the players you know, develop that stronger sense of of understanding of what's in front of them and what should what should they be seeing and why aren't they seeing it which allowed them to to, to almost work on the move to get people set to to get going again. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of put you on the spot here. Not like me really at all. But you know the, the level of detail we've gone through now it, with this especially. I think this is quite an important tool that, that coaches can can utilize in terms of gaining more reflection into their practice. We managed to do this with a with the, an adult because of the age grade that, that we were sort of looking at I suppose. Have you ever so I know now you're where you're in the environment you're working in now could you adapt this, change this for younger age groups through the system to encourage more reflective practice for coaches to do with their players? Yeah, certainly. So I think, you know, maybe you don't necessarily, you know, have to have um, a booklet out to out to each out to each player. You can have, you know, you might just have a whiteboard for you to just uh, us as coaches to just note down, note, note down what 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 the players are saying. Um, I think if you're working with say under 15, 16, 17s or 18s, you probably have to take a little bit more of a of a lead on it rather than allowing just the players to discuss. You know, I think when we use this in both the university environment at Leeds Beckett and at Old Lot Institute with with adults, um, you know, a lot of them have kind of developed a game understanding um sometimes not always a good game understanding but there's some sort of game understanding there um and you know they, 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 i think they're more confident in terms of getting that across um whereas you know when i'm you know what, what i found is you know like a, today i've done a video review with 
with um, the development group that we have here at the City of Oxford College. And, you know, instead of, you know, we, they didn't go out and get booklets, but, you know, I still ask those questions. I'll compose it and I say, right, how do we win this next phase? How do we gain territory here? And then it's important for me as a coach to really listen and, and, and hear their different solutions. And for example, today we've had, we've, I had a group of four, uh, um, one side of the room and a group of four on the other side that, that came up with two completely very different solutions. And which, which isn't necessarily a bad thing either. No, because no. there should be there should be multiple outcomes for them to be to be able to see. I suppose. Yeah, and I and, and, and that was I loved it, and that's for me as a as a as a practicing coach, you know, that they're the moments in which I can explore these different it's different different things with the players and actually gain an understanding of right why did you so for example we we hit we made a half break on the outside. Um, one of the players said that we should just fall into playing off of nine. And the other said we should play play off ten and hit hit the middle. And I just wanted to explore the re the reasons the reasons for why they were why they were different. Um, and as actually the ten felt he was you know he felt confident enough to be able to catch the ball, carry it to the line, and and put the player into space. Now you know if he feels that he's confident to do that, why why would I why why would you not let him have his say and go out and give it a go on the training paddock afterwards. You know, it's you know, it's a, it's it's allowing them to have that expression of right. This is what I can do, and this is what I want to be able to do. And we're going to just and we we can discuss it now. And there's no right. Or, there's not necessarily a right or wrong option, unless they say I'm going to drop kick it after we've made a half break and we're still sixty meters out. That's a wrong option. <laughs> but uh, you know, if they're, if they're creative, can, some would say. Ours. <laughs> the big the big c um no you're right you, you're right you're exactly right and, and i'm uh, i thought that would be sort of what you'd say because it, it does it comes you could do this in group work you could do this in um you know mix forwards and backs together i mean because cause we even did that with it with we, we spoke earlier about previews you know we we actually got the the, the forwards and backs into groups um in the in the previews for games and you know, the backs will go away and talk about what backs do usually, you know, hair dye or, you know, the, that, that sort of thing. Forwards would be, you know, talking about the game. And, the, but then we'd actually get them, they'd talk about sort of what they expected of each other, but then what they expected of the other half of the team and then come back and present their expectations back to the players. And, and I think mixing them groups and getting them to engage more gives forwards a better understanding of what backs actually do. I should have had more of that playing because then, you know, give them a bit more credit than I do now rather than just knock it on on the edge. Um, and forward, backs would have a better, more understanding of, of, of forward play and the hard work and that goes into that. And, and I think getting players to communicate in that way, in a more positional way, is, is a really valuable tool that coaches can use. Yeah, and it's... and you're. And you're almost taking away the competition element, the the on field. I think when you put, get players on the field, it's it, it's hard to have those open discussions around. Right, I think we could be doing this when we could be doing this because you know nowadays training intensities are, are higher. We're looking to get on the move a little bit more. We're playing more game based stuff in which there's less stop start. So actually having a breather and and actually talking about the off, talking off field with a video review structure actually probably you know enables greater discussions and like you said you can you know add it add it add it, add it quite su successfully to your preview as well and that, and that actually is something in in Eddie Jones's book um, that's two book references in this episode for me that's in fact three actually i think it's three but in his book, he he actually talks about how when he came in as the England uh, coach, that he wanted to get the players to be more proactive in downtime in games, is in talking about what they're doing, solutions and 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 things like that. And I, and 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 that is you know that, that's where players are constantly thinking about the game and getting distracted. And we all know from and working within the community game or the university or even in a club level. You know, players will get distracted in downtime when the ball's out, if there's a water break, if it's an injury. And they might not necessarily be focusing on the game. If you get them to engage in this reflection and they, they're talking to each other more about outcomes that are happen, happening in the game, 
they're going to use that downtime more effectively because they'll actually be planning and pre-planning the options that are available for them to regain momentum after a stoppage and things like that. And I, and I thought reading his book, I thought that's a really powerful point. And through this reflection is a way for you to try and achieve that within the game at our level that we work in. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly, exactly. What's most surprising is you've read three books in your life and you've <laughs> you mentioned them all in one episode. So you've... <laughs> You shot yourself in the foot in future episodes, Chris. I have. I have. I better go, and, better go and see what's on Amazon. <laughs> Other bookstores are available. <laughs> but yes, no, it's um, you know, and like, like we said throughout, it's you know, this this is a process that we that we applied um, at our first year at Lord of the Engines and, and the subsequent um, years following. Um, we're not saying this is the winning formula. We're not saying this works in every environment use it and you become success that's 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 not what this is about this is us just sharing um sharing what we did sharing our ideas and you know and if anyone's got ideas that go against or or, or differ slightly um or you know ideas that probably might be a maybe a step further or a step below and that i want to share in these discussions um please feel free on across across our social media because that's you know i'm this is you know i think it, it interests both of us that's why we set up this podcast so yeah please feel free to to share yeah and, and i think what, what's important is we're not we're not we're not saying that yeah everyone should go away and do this now and i'll, I'll reiterate a message that we've said throughout this whole season of what works for who in what circumstance and why so if something that we've discussed here might spark that curiosity in your coaching where you go actually that sounds quite interesting i might go and do a little bit more reading around that but i think what all this stems down to is is be be proactive and be positive with your planning get a, an understanding of your participants because that's massively going to influence what and how you deliver take the time to really understand first of all your why why you're coaching why you're there and develop your understanding of the sport so you're fully understanding of, of if you're coaching something know why you know know the game know the processes you want to go through and then align that to there's loads and i mean loads of stuff on the internet on twitter around different types of practice structures and they're all great there's some great content out there about what you can go out and deliver on the field there are some positive examples on the Big Breakdown HQ YouTube channel, which you can also go and check out. Um, but there are lots of stuff online that you can you can look at. But you need to don't just look at something like uh, uh, because it's shiny and new and take it and use it and not understand the process of how can that fit in with your players, because every environment will be different, every player will be different. So just because you've seen it and it looks good and it operated well that's because it's in that environment that, that they're delivering it in. You might have to tweak it, change it, and adapt it to fully see the benefits in your environment. Yes. Yeah. And that just links back to everything you just said so so eloquently. Thanks. Thanks. All comes back to the who, what, how. The whole thing comes back to who, what, how, and planning, delivery, and reflection. It's like it's like we've planned and delivered the series, Chris. Oh, yeah, which is yeah, you know, we had a few months of planning. I didn't we? Make, we weren't that busy. No, no. <laughs> the joys of furlough, eh? Um, so, guys, uh, the, we, we are going to um, we're going to move this on now and, and introduce the winners of our uh, Canterbury Boot Competition. But like Harrison said, uh, if if you've got any questions around anything that we've discussed, um, please drop us a message. We're happy to share, engage, discuss everything that we've mentioned. Um, there's, there's, you know, we're, we're, we're an open book. We're, we're happy to share. Um, and even if you, like I said, you, you disagree with something, get in contact with us. We're happy to think if we've, we've not phrased something right or delivered something right, then, then, then please, please let us know. Um, but just some ideas for you to take into your planning as we move forward into what hopefully will be an uninterrupted, um, and fully lord uh, rugby season from, from September 21 so boots 
Shall we, shall we, shall we announce the winners? A couple of weeks ago, we've got four pairs of boots to give away. We're giving away one away on YouTube, one away on Facebook, and two away on Instagram. I'm going to do the draw now. So, Harrison, exciting. Are we ready? Are you ready to go with the wheel of names? Yes, yes, yes. The wheel, the wheel of names. Um, yeah. So first up, we've got the, the names YouTube first from, from the YouTube. So best of luck to everyone. Yeah. Good luck. Peter. And the winner is Pete Small. Well done, Pete. We'll uh, we'll be in contact um, to get all your contact details, ready to pass them on to Canterbury. Congratulations. Facebook now, Harrison. Should we yeah. should we do that one? So there's one bear of boot to give away on on Facebook. Yes, plenty more names on the Facebook than there were on on the YouTube. So Facebook, let's go. Good luck, everyone. Tracy Roberts, congratulations, Tracy. We will be in contact uh, to get your details, similar with Pete, so we can pass them on. So the last one, so we're giving two away on Instagram. Um, a lot of entries on there. Yes, quite a few entries on on um, on the on the Instagram. Just best of luck. Tom Kiff, congratulations, Tom. First, first winner of the pair of boots on Instagram. Let's draw the second pair. Giveaway number two on Instagram. Let's go. And best of luck to everyone on Instagram again. Ooh. Congratulations, Gil Gil Gilbs, nineteen sixty nine. Congratulations! So there we have it, four winners. Thank you again to Canterbury for for giving us a, a fantastic prize to give away. Uh, we'll contact all the winners uh, in the next couple of days, um, just to, so we can arrange to get your prize sent out. So congratulations, guys! Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Uh, we'll be uh, we'll be back in two weeks for the final episode of season one, which will be just a bit more of a reflection of the overall season. Charlie's got all of our details about social media at the end, and we'll see you next time. Cheers for listening. Don't forget to join in the discussion at Big Breakdown HQ on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. <laughs>